week by week, I've just slowly deteriorated. Are you in pain? No. No pain. No pain. I talked to the nurse and she said my hemoglobin will drop enough that I will just, you know, go in my sleep. So you, you can never predict death. That's one of the, the big things that you learn to do is you don't pretend to be God. You really have no idea when someone's going to die. I always tell families you have to prepare for the worst. You don't know how long you're going to have, but you always hope for the best. It started two weeks ago, he started falling and we noticed symptoms and we brought him to the hospital and I think we both knew once we bring him to the hospital, he probably won't be coming home. We just knew the way he looked and he said the tumor's grown quite large and the tumor's also bleeding, which was the bigger concern. So they said we have to take him off his blood thinners and, and hope that that stops the bleeding. I believe there's such a thing as a healthy death, if you know what I mean. That, that we can enable people to have better experiences living through dying and worse experiences. It's exhausting looking after people dying. It, it's emotionally exhausting, it's physically exhausting because you have to be careful with everything you say because everyone has a different background, different comfort level with death and so you have to take your vibes from them. But they said there's no more treatments to be done and I'm sorry but this could change things and we got the impression that he had maybe days. If it's a bad death, they always have the what ifs, you know. They find the grief and bereavement difficult and they can't move on. Uh, if they have a good death, it uplifts everybody, it uplifts the whole family, so. I got three kids, Mercedes. Jada and Dennis, and I've been married for 24 years. Yay! Yay! <laughs> to my wonderful husband who's down there. My husband. Yeah. You're on kind of camera. 24 years. I started out with um, non Hodgkins, and then I got Hodgkins, and I've been going through treatment and treatment and treatment, and they run out of treatments for me. So this is where I wanted to be when I pass. If I pass, I'm still alive. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm gonna keep going as long as I can. That's my motto. Live to the end and go quickly. When my life is almost gone, hear me cry. Hear me call, hold my hand, least I fall. Take my hand, precious Lord, lead me home. When the darkness appears and the night draws near and the day is past and gone, at the river I stand, guide my feet, hold my hand, take my hand, precious Lord, lead me home. When you're in a residential hospice like Bethel House, there's a lot of support for each other with the staff and there's volunteers and there's medications there all the time. When you're trying to look after someone in the community, they might call you in the middle of the night in huge pain that just started and you have, you have no supplies, you have you know, no intravenous morphine or things like that. I mean, you tried to anticipate what someone might need, but death is unpredictable, you don't know. How often do you guys come and see your mom? I come every day. You come every day? How does it feel? Does it feel weird or does it feel normal now? Normal now, but it was weird the first few days. 
it's, uh, it's, it's been a journey. It's surreal. It, it really is a surreal time right now. For me, I feel like I'm kind of in the clouds a little bit myself. Some days waking up, hopefully that the cancer's gone away and we're back to life as usual, but unfortunately that's not the case, so. There's mommy and me. There's mom. This morning with Jada, I finished off her scrapbooking. I wrote a few things in there, and that was pretty difficult to, to write. It says, this is my old cottage, and I had, I think it says a good, and I had good times. Time spent with you is time spent well. I put hope, heart, time together. And then there's mommy and daddy. And last year we were at my brother's skidooing. We were on the ice playing hockey. That's my sister. She can't do any of it anymore. She can't do any of it. And as she throws her hands up in the air and says, this is all I have left. I must say, kids have been phenomenal uh, through this. But that's mainly because her mom prepped them. I'm just a support guy. She started uh, getting, getting ready for this a long time ago and getting the kids ready for it. And, and that's why the kids have done as well as they have. It's one thing to say goodbye to your husband. It's another thing to say goodbye to your kids. Right. I've done treasure boxes, and I've done treasure books, so they'll have memories of me, and I have special gifts, so they'll always remember me. So if we talk about somebody like Jackie, she has young children, young women, young men in her life, and she's seen them grow to the stage, and she has to let go of them, hoping the best for them, but knowing that she's never going to be able to be there at their side if they have a problem, or you know, if they have a great joy. She'll never be able to be there for them. And that's, that's a big loss. I would tell him that I love him, and that I'm proud of him, He's been a great son, and uh, I don't know what else. You just take it day by day. She's at peace, so there's no reason for us to be like distraught about it. She's okay with it, so. She's been a fighter, and I'll be honest with you, I thought she could beat this. She made it feel that, you know, she was going to beat this, and it was going to happen that way. And uh, we were rooting for her from the beginning. But it was in April, and she called. And she said there was nothing left they could do for her. And she said that that was it. Through our whole lives, we were friends, not just sisters. And we went through so many things together. And I was sitting in my hot tub, thinking I was clear of cancer. And um, no, it came back about six months later. And uh, like I said, the journey's been up and down. Oh, we can salvage this. We can still cure this. And I thought, okay, I still have hope. And I went in for a bone marrow transplant. That was rough. But got out of there, I thought, okay, I'm done. Came back. Yeah, my cancer figured out every which way. Now I sit here five years later, almost six. And I'm proud that I've lived this long with cancer. I feel very grateful that I had five years because I, I know other people that only had a year. Happy birthday, dear Jackie. Happy birthday to you. This is at Mommy's 50th party. Me and Mommy. This is our family together. Yeah, I, you know, I remember lots of times before she was sick. A lot different than she is now. She was so much more always ready to do something. Now it seems like she feels trapped because she can't get up. She can't like go everywhere that she wants to. Mommy dancing with Dennis and then skiing because that's what Mommy always does. Are you angry? Angry? No. Upset? Yeah, like, I don't want her to be going through it. You just kind of got to go through it. Like, she, it's happened to her. There's nothing we can do about it, so it's going to go on. She's done a good job with you. 
Yeah, he's done really well actually. And I'm very proud of him. And I love him very much. And uh, he's been a really good son. And Elizabeth Kubler-Ross was the first major mainstream interpreter of death and dying. And she wrote books called On Death and Dying, about five books. And she talked about the stages of dying and the stages after death. And she was really a profound um, change maker. Some of her ideas have, have been uh, refined and developed and, and some of them have even been, uh, you know, replaced. But she really brought it into the mainstream. She was able to make it the connection of that it's part of the journey. And, and it was a, a fine part of the journey, a, a good part of the journey and could be very good. Every step we've reached, we're like, oh, the hardest part is going to be when they give us that final diagnosis. And then they did. And we had a really rough couple of days, but then we got on the other side of it. For some people, they have developed a belief system. They know this is going to happen. But for many people, they don't know what's going to happen next. And it's terrifying. There's something about the circle of life that we can accept it to a certain point, and then we really struggle with that. Death is an honorable process. and. It's, it's integrated into the most vital and exciting parts of life. He's not ready. He's, he's too young. Yeah. One of his biggest things he always talked about was turning 65 and retiring. We all know that you begin and you have a middle and you have an end. We know that, but nobody wants it to end. We're still a young family and we deserve to have him around and that's not going to happen. But to know that it's a permanent goodbye is, I don't know how, I don't know how to answer that. Like to, I don't think you can say goodbye. <laughs> My daughter, Elizabeth, who's very active today, and she and Nancy were both with VON, doing home care as nurses, as registered nurses. I joined the Victorian Order of Nurses, which is essentially home care nursing. So you go into people's homes, look after them. So we had older people, we had, um, yeah, every, we had teenagers, we had every possible age, every possible diagnosis and you had to know everything about everything. We'd have Alzheimer's, mental illness, um, mom and baby feeding problems. I had one year though that was quite significant for me. I was probably 30 years old and I had three small children myself. And I looked after in that one year, three women in their 30s, all who died leaving children. And I felt heartbroken. And I thought, well, I'm gonna be next. Liz would come home after work and say, Mom, we need a hospice here. I am so tired, and we're all tired, of having to send people to hospital when it's the end of life and there's nothing a hospital can do for them. I think there has to be a better way. There has to be a better way than, than, than these such confused and um, conflicted directions. Hospitals are designed to enable people to live, to n not to die, not to die in a beautiful and a dignified way. They're designed to keep people alive as long as possible. And it's lonely. They don't get the proper care because the nurses haven't time. And what they really need is a home atmosphere and tender loving care and pain control. Death and dying are part of the same circle of life. And we must accept it, even though 
we feel very much how much we're going to miss that person. Life is not to be full of burdens. I was taught our only responsibility in life is to be happy. And how can we be happy if we are constantly fearing death, which could happen at any second? Now, it is changing a bit, slowly. We have now some palliative rooms in hospitals, but it's still, it's not hospice as in death or hospice. It's not at all like that. Picture this guy peeling his um, grapefruit. grapefruit. It probably is four. No trailer grapefruit. You find a little cop eating your grapefruit? <laughs> no. <laughs> Jamie, at the age of 46, was dying of cancer. And Tony and I went out after several times for serious surgery. And in the end, in 2003, he died. Terrible death. Um, Mom had nowhere to sit at his bedside. She ended up sleeping on the floor with her knitting bag under her head because there was no pillows. And uh, he had a six-year-old son who was terrified to visit him in hospital. Uh, it wasn't a good death, in, not in a good place. A wonderful hospital on the palliative care floor, wonderful nurses, but it was a hospital. We thought palliative meant that we could be by his side and there, it would be a comfortable room, an easy place for family to visit and, and that he could feel relaxed there, but it's not. It felt cold in a way, and mechanical, and dad, he wouldn't complain about anything. He, he ate the hospital food, but we just didn't picture this hospital room looking at a, a industrial roof outside his window would be, that's where he spent his last days. And I think the word palliative, it is such a nebulous word. I still don't totally understand it. I was in a, the palliative care ward at uh, a very well-known hospital downtown Toronto. And my darling brother was in palliative care and I didn't see any palliative care. And all I wanted to do was pick up the skeletal body of my beautiful brother and carry him up to Bethel. I was so distraught with the lack of palliative care. We have you know, physicians in, in clinics and we go to them and then we have hospitals if you're more, if you're more ill. And then we, we have, if you're ill and dying, we should have hospices available to everyone who cannot manage at home, who cannot manage at home. We were sitting around the kitchen table after Jamie had died and I said, you know, Mom, we really need a residential hospice. And that was when my children all said, Mom, let's start the hospice. Everywhere she went, she'd talk about, do you know what hospice is? In England, hospice is a noun. She said, I want to make hospice into a word of action. She did a lot of volunteer work in her life. She felt that when she's born into privilege, which she was, that you need to give back even more. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, she would fundraise in any way she could. The strongest, most determined women I had ever met, and no one ever left Lorna without putting their hand in their pocket to help her build her dream hospice. My dad died when I was 14, and so mom was on her own for a lot of years and I saw her be the husband and the wife, and she could do anything, fix cars, you know, do plumbing, electricity. She was quite amazing. This is the nicest, longest birthday I've ever had, and uh, I hope we don't record anymore because otherwise I'll be up there with uh, my seniors. Monsignor, thank you all for coming. It's been great fun. When my stepfather Tony Bethel was about 82, he developed malignant melanoma, and eventually it spread to his lungs, his brain, and his uh, bones. 
They wanted to send him to a palliative care unit down at Princess Margaret and told mom she wouldn't be able to handle him at home. And she said, I can handle him at home. My daughter's a nurse and my son-in-law is a, is a doctor and we're gonna look after him at home and we did. He said nobody should have a lonely death. Is that Tony Bethel? That's Tony, Tony Bethel, Bethel, my husband, and he was in The Great Escape. Great Escape that, that came out as a, a very famous movie. Uh, the Great Escape. The Great Adventure begins with The Great Escape. Except my stepfather, Tony Bethel, always says, wasn't really beautiful blue sky and green grass. It was solid mud and gray and cold. How old was your mom when she met Tony? Late 30s, and they got married when she was 40. She was so tired of being put together with other men on dates, um, blind dates. She decided to wear her ugliest dress and not wash her hair. <laughs> and she walked in and it was yeah, kind of love at first sight. He was really a dreamboat. He had movie star good looks. He was gracious and elegant. I just thought he was a beautiful man in physicality and within. This Dutch girl broke through the Germans, grabbed me by the arm and said, God bless you. Well, now, at that point, I very nearly burst into tears. He was very young when he was captured during World War II. Um, he was a, a RAF pilot. On that day, our job was to go to Germany. When the Dutch coast came in sight on the horizon, that's when I and I'm sure a lot of others started being frightened and I, I was certainly always frightened. I was deeply moved when I read Tony's story and was told Tony's story. He was quite an amazing man. He spent his 21st birthday in prisoner of war camp. This uh, very, very militaristic but a, a dark, dingy uh, world. The most notorious of the special prison camps for airmen was Stalag Luft III, the scene of the Great Escape. Stalag Luft III was situated deep in the heart of the Third Reich, 100 miles southeast of Berlin, in what is now Poland. All my family immigrated from Poland, and a lot of the family was lost, and my father was in the war, and his story in some ways is a parallel story to Tony Bethel's. But my father was also shot down in the war. He wasn't in a, in a um, concentration camp, he was in a POW camp like Tony, and he survived. During the Second World War, Allied air crew suffered horrific losses. Nearly a quarter of a million men failed to return from their missions. I indicated uh, my wish to be involved and in a fairly short time I was put onto the security side, which is called sort of being a stooge. Uh, it really, you, you, stood, you stood on the corner of a building and kept your, kept your eye uh, out for a, a German uh, uh, security, the, the ferrets and the uh, other people, any Germans in the camp. It was a very vital part of the, uh, the, the security thing was because the, the success of being able to dig tunnels was uh, dependent on the ability to open them up, up and close them down very quickly. The first time I went down, uh, down, uh, down dig, I was astonished. I was astonished at the, uh, at the design, uh, just what a, an extraordinary thing this was, that here we were stuck wherever we were stuck and somehow a shaft had been sunk 30 feet deep with ladder down the side all shored up against sand and then at the bottom there was a workroom and there was a place to put sand, there was a place to rest and I, I, I was just amazed at the ingenuity of so many of my fellow prisoners. And then uh, inevitably I think probably the first time I crawled along the tunnel a slight sense possibly of, 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 of claustrophobia but in, in, the, in the company of others I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it because you, you were amongst people who'd, who'd been doing it for a long time, knew what they were doing, and you were, I don't know, part of the team, whatever it was. They escaped in pairs, um, and Hitler was so furious that they had 
so many had managed to escape. And he said, shoot them all. And his sidekick said, you can't mine Fuhrer. And so mine Fuhrer said, all right, kill 50. He rounded up 50 and shot them kind of one at a time, two at a time, behind trees and all over the place. Cookie Long, I mean, if he was shot, why wasn't I? And at that time, my reaction was, uh, I was a, a pretty good Aryan specimen. I was blue-eyed, I was young. So Tony was one of 22 who survived, and I think spent the rest of his life feeling guilty that his friends died and he lived. He was the last to be shot, and uh, it, it must have been a very sort of frightening, sad, lonely death he had. How did he survive? He was just one of the lucky 22 who was not shot. He was taken back to prisoner of war camp and stayed till the very end of the war and he was released. He said, nobody should have a lonely death. So that was the beginning of the idea. Mom and I would talk about it morning, noon, and night because it became an obsession. That's the only way you can get things done, I think, if you were totally obsessed with it for a while. She did everything she could. She worked with the architects to make sure that it was just going to be perfect. We had to have somewhere in this community for people to go at the end of life. She's an example for us all. Mum goes around, there is not one person that she doesn't meet or who's in her family or friends that she doesn't tell about hospice, tell about the importance of hospice, and get a contribution from them. It's incredible. The whole community has joined and supported us. And we kept thinking, how are we ever going to do this monumental task, not only of building it, but of raising five and a half million dollars? Our donors have been fantastic. The Grahams who supported me from the word go and came to every blinking meeting we had in my living room or dining room or wherever. Lorna knew a lot of people. You know, she, she put the arm on people and said, listen, this is my vision, this community needs it. I'm putting up uh, a good sum of money here. I need your support for this. I wanted the hospice to be the best. You have been our biggest donor and our biggest fundraiser. You are so passionate about Bethel House that no one can turn you down. It's the most exciting thing that's ever happened. It just became a dream. And some people thought we were trying to build an institution. Well, we certainly got that squashed pretty quickly. Building and design committee poured over the plans, making sure every detail was taken care of. We worked very hard, uh, right from the very early site planning stage. I am very proud of you, Mum, and cannot thank you enough for all you have done. It was pretty perfect what she did. She connected with everybody. Anybody and everybody. Mom was amazing. Um, she found a new skill later in life that she, no one can say no. Even a policeman stopping her for speeding one day up in Caledon, she, uh, after the policeman had told her her misdemeanor, she said, have you heard of this project we've got going? And she'd talk about Bethel House <laughs> to the policeman. Because she gave, 
All her friends gave. People had confidence that this was really going to happen. There are many of our family members that haven't been involved in philanthropy, one way or another. You know, having your own pocket picked or picking other people's pockets. <laughs> uh, all of us to one degree or another. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's a way to give back to your community. So it took from 2005 to 2010 when we opened. So five years to raise the money, break ground, build it and open it. Lorna actually called me her baby brother. But I never thought of myself as a baby brother. I was, uh, in many ways, uh, a mentor for Lorna when she wanted it. We set out just to build a place for people to die. And then all of a sudden, we're finding that it gives fulfillment to Mom's life, like a whole different side of it that she never thought she'd find, like a place to put her energy and her, her gifts. She was a perfect person to have the vision for Bethel Hospice and had the energy of uh, 10 people. Arguably, this project of creating a facility for the community that would provide others with the same care she was able to give Tony extended her life for probably the seven years that you refer to. I mean, once the building was built, she uh, made it her own. I never felt so safe and in the right place until I started volunteering at Bethel, and it just totally took my heart. We didn't want institutional at all. We wanted people to walk in the door and go, wow, I've come home. The light coming from the windows, Bethel is just full of light and opening. So if you walk into Bethel House, you can see light coming in uh, north, south, east, and west through all the windows, a huge uh, ceil vaulted ceilings. The, the ceiling is an interesting architecture. It's almost like an alpine lodge or something, and there's a lot of wood. To walk in and see the high ceilings, the beams, so we had nature, and, and Lorna and Tony loved nature and a rural setting. And then we brought in my stepbrother, Rafe Bethel, who's an interior designer. And the two of them decided on all of the color codes for each room, the um, motif of a flower for each room, and the material that would be on every sofa, chair, every piece of furniture. The interior design and the, the, the decor and the furnishings became really important. The attention to detail, I think is huge. A well-furnished home, there's no institutional feel to it. They were an independent creation, each room. They're all bright, they all have, they're all named after flowers. One of the rooms actually uh, was responsible for, in my late wife's memory. Which room? Uh, the room's named after flowers. Yes. It's a poppy room. Yes. So one of the wonderful things that Bethel Hospice is able to offer to our families and to our residents is the beautiful gardens that we have here. It's very important to most people at end of life and during life, but specifically end of life, to be in touch with nature. And so we specially chose this four acre property. To have them go out so that the last thing they saw with any luck was gonna be tall daisies and flowers and butterflies and birds. And so that was our guiding principle. We put our, our hospice right in the center. And so every view is of nature, birds, flowers. We have a wonderful landscape committee that spends, I don't even know how many hours, tending the soil. Tell me about your day. Oh, it's been fabulous. It's been uh, enlightening, it's been fulfilling, it's been just inspiring. 
just tell me again so we're talking about how much landscaping is being done we're doing and probably today with we had to buy our thing anywhere between 40 to fifty thousand dollars worth of landscaping so what we have here is, is the landscape plan we're going to plant things that grow in the existing soil we're not going to try and plant things that you have to baby along It's a little early in the season, but at the end of July, most of the stuff in here will probably be about four feet tall. This will be spring, this will be fall. We all as a committee didn't mind acquiescing to Lorna's, well, what's wrong with some color in the spring? It looks like hell when there's nothing blooming. I never met Hart and Lorna's mum, but this is a, a really lovely plaque and a loving mother in Arden Garden. Gardner, and we want to do her proud, so this is what I thought would be a good place for this plaque. Diana's got some great ideas for sort of enhancing this area when you work hand in hand with Mother Nature. Nice things happen. You know, when I think about Bethel, I think about Bethel as a person. I think of this uh, it, having a spirit, a body, a mind, a heart, it's a, a, a complete entity. The building people talk about all the time has a feel to it when you walk in. It's more than just a house. Certainly anybody who goes into Bethel House comes out and says, gee, now I understand, that is an amazing place. It's a home away from home. It's like going to uh, to somebody you love very much and them embracing you and not holding you too tight and not pushing you away, just holding you just the right way. You can't sort of underestimate the power of this place and what a, a good death means to people. The ability to stop being caregiver and be husband or son for two days or three days or three weeks or three hours even uh, means to people. I think of her as a very accepting, inviting place to end your life. Where you can go to be yourself and to be taken care of by nurses, PSWs, doctors. They are taking care of you and your family members and your friends can come to visit with you and be who they are. I think people think of hospice as a very sad place, maybe very institutionalized as well. It's not a place of sadness. People think, oh, it must be really awful. People must be crying all over the place. There are, yes, certain moments when, yes, people are in grief, but there's no feeling of overarching sadness to it. It's wonderful to watch the people and the families as they are admitted. They come in and they look terrified as they walk in the front door. And I think they're in for about half an hour and they're right at home. <laughs> but they're absolutely terrified coming in the front door. It's just a home environment. Like, I, do, I just feel like sort of like calm, even though I know that I'm dealing with a really stressful job there because obviously sometimes you're running for one person on and off through your shift because you're trying to manage symptoms. But at the end of the shift, you still feel comfortable and you just still feel like you were not at work because it's the environment of that place. It's the environment of Bethel Hospice. Bethel is like a home environment. So it's like me, when I come to work every morning, it's like me leaving one home and just coming to another. The only difference is I put scrubs on for this one. See, in a hospice, we refer to them as a resident, not a patient. Why is that? Because we want their rooms to be their homes. We call them residents at Bath Hospice just because this is their place, their room. They can personalize their room, hang their own paintings. They have their own bar fridge where they can keep their own food. They can have alcohol, wine, beer. You can bring your dogs, you can bring your cats. They can stay overnight. They sleep on the beds. I think if even you had a horse, they could manage to get the head through the, the door because every room has its own door to the outside. So we're all very aware that um, people don't live in our workspace. We work in their home. 
so that's their place that's their house and we are visitors there so that's why I always knock on the door when I enter because you're not gonna enter in someone's home without knocking or without ringing a bell you're gonna enter after their permission most people don't prefer to die in the hospital they prefer to die at home when that's not possible hospice is probably the next best thing and the fact is that families can come in all kinds of configurations and live with the person who's dying as if they were in their own home. They can stay there, they can talk to their loved one, be with their loved one right to the end and not have to worry about anything else. It's what the family's needs are and what the residents needs. This is their home, their space, their rules, their choices. For me it's just like it's about them. I try to listen because listening is one of the most important thing in nursing and it's always about my residents or my patients. It's not about me. You really want to try and figure out what people want, right? And sometimes that means, listen, I want as little pain as humanly possible and if that means I have to be asleep, I don't care. I don't want to be in pain. Your needs are what's important. You need to tell me what it is that you want. My role is to educate them, empower them with the education. My role is to ensure they have as peaceful death as possible, whatever that takes. It's not only a beautiful place, she is not only beautiful, but she is wise. And the wisdom comes through the, the people who are there, the volunteers and the staff. Showers on the, the person who's dying and embraces them and enables them in many cases to get to a, a better place, a different place than they would have in any other environment. Each volunteer brings with them their backgrounds, their skills, their personalities. Um, each one is an individual and it's amazing. Our volunteers are so important to us that they participate in everything. You know, if we're not able to do something, they're right at the bedside for us. Everyone would say, oh, aren't you wonderful to volunteer at Bethel? And we all would say, no, we receive so much from all of our residents and staff. We are given so much to be here. And the nurses, we get along with the nurses, we're just like family. We're all family there. I was never sure what I'm interested in. Like, I never knew that my interest is palliative care. I get to know that my interest is palliative care when I actually started working at Bathau. What is palliative care? Palliative care, what is it? It's, it's really fulsome care for people who are facing an illness that doesn't have a cure, whatever that might be. And that can be cancer, it can be chronic lung disease, it can be congestive heart failure. Those don't have cures, and eventually people often die from them. Um, and palliative care is really about good symptom management and control of whatever symptoms come along. Palliative care is an area where there is a lot of um, need for education because people just hear word palliative and they just think like, okay, automatically that, they, oh, I'm dying now. You don't die of palliative. There is an underlying diagnosis, a disease process, and I think Part of the reason people are afraid of palliative is because we use the term palliative like it's a diagnosis and like it's an ending as opposed to a way to provide care and a philosophy of care. At Bethel I learned how to provide holistic care to these uh, residents and their families and then we look for not just their symptoms, we also look what are their challenges. So the word palliate actually means to cloak means to, to cover someone, to wrap them. It's a beautiful way to think about palliative care because we think about, um, you know, the warmth, the embrace, the covering, the protecting. I think it's appropriate, it makes sense, right? We're, we're wrapping these people in care in this sort of team of people taking care of them. Obviously physicians, primary care, nursing, uh, social work, spiritual care. We need to involve our social workers, we need to involve spiritual person because most of the times it's something else going on. It's a full person and we're treating them from not only their physical symptoms but their psychological symptoms and dealing with their families and helping the families get through it too. One of the things that we really work hard to do well is to tailor and customize our care for each resident or every client and every family member different because everybody needs a different cloak. You have to try and figure out what they value and what they 
they really want out of the end of their life. It's the whole package. It's caring for the residents, it's caring for the family, it's caring for each other staff-wise. Without that big a team, you couldn't do it. You can't do this on your own. Uh, palliative care is a, is a team sport. So that's where nurses and doctors, we all work together to help them achieve what they want, whatever they, they wished for, and we try to make their last wish come true. I remember sitting at the bedside holding his hand and my mother was kind of roaming the room and this is what I mean when, I'm, when I say it's very hard at times to try and tell a family member and I'm having to now tell my mother that my dad is actively dying because at that point he was actively dying and I'm saying you need to sit by his side, you need to hold his hand, you need to tell him how much you love him. Sorry. And she couldn't? She could. She could. But she struggled with still understanding what was going on. How was it to be both, you know, a daughter and a caregiver? I wasn't. I chose only one career at that point, and I chose to only be his daughter. I did no care on my father. I think that he would have probably swatted me one maybe if I did. I just wanted to I just wanted to be his daughter at that point and I needed to be daughter for both my mom and my dad. When I reflect back to it now, I remember holding his hand and I remember hearing his voice and him asking me if he would die from this of dementia and I said no you'll die of an underlining factor. I took hold of his hand one last time because I knew he had suffered for so long and I begged him to go and I begged my mother to let him go. And I promised him I would look after her. Your life will never be easy without him. As no family member's life is ever easy when their loved one pass, it's just different. And that's what I tell our residents and that's what I tell, that's what I told my mother, so. There's a beautiful cartoon, a Peanuts cartoon, and it shows Charlie Brown and, and Snoopy talking, and it says something like, um, Charlie Brown says, you know, one day we're all going to die, and Snoopy says something like, yes, but it's only one day, every other day we live. What is it about death and dying that makes us so scared of it? Oh, what is it about death and dying that makes us scared? I think everybody has a different reason for that. We need to talk more about death and dying. We need to learn more about the beliefs, the different traditions that are out there, because I don't think there's one that's right or wrong. Both in the medical field and, and I think in society, we have a death-dying culture. We don't like to talk about it. We don't, like, we're all dying, though. I mean, we're all going to die. There's no, there's no other way out of here. Death is death. We're born and we die. It's just a natural path of how our lives will go. It's just the next experience. Our soul is such energy, and energy doesn't die, so. So when it comes to myself, like, I'm always prepared for myself, sort of like, okay, it's natural, it's gonna come one day. But when I try to talk about it, uh, I don't think my family would also like to hear those words, like, they don't. Back in the old days, you had a parlor in your front hall. That was the parlor. That's where you kept the dead body for three days before you went to the cemetery. There, no, there were no funeral homes 80, 100 years ago, right? You had a parlor. Death has become so medicalized in, in our system, and especially in the hospital, that we suddenly, as a society, think we need to just keep living, keep living, keep living. But for what? For what? For what? What's the end result in that? And what do you really want out of your life? If you have six months left, what do you really want to do? The idea is that you have a chance to live through dying, to, to experience it fully, 
to not push it away, to not, you know, close your eyes to it, but to actually feel it and go through it. Not everyone does, not everyone wishes to, not everyone can, but there is that opportunity at Bethel Hospice to do that. A lot of people I don't think are as afraid to die as they are worried about what it's going to look like or what it's going to feel like. People struggle with death and dying because I think they think it looks, this might be a harsh word, but maybe it looks ugly. It might somewhere else, but it doesn't in hospice. The thought of him passing in the hospital was a lot harder to take than passing here. You've done everything that you needed to do for that individual and their family, so they've died at peace. And grief and bereavement is something that is like a fingerprint. It is different for everyone. You have made it so different than what we thought it could be. Thank you, thank you, thank you. That we are able to alleviate and reduce people's anxiety and fears. I always made a promise to myself when I started working here that nobody would die alone. When it happens, we're going to be heartbroken, but I need you to know we're going to be okay. And I wasn't always sure if we would, but being here in just a matter of days, it, I do feel like we're going to be okay, and mainly because he's taken care of and they even assured us if it happens and we're not here, someone will be here with him. Whether it's a nurse or a PSW or a social worker or volunteer. Or... When I called her doctor, her first question was, was my mom alone? And I'm like, no, your mom was not alone. I was holding her hand while she was dying. It feels special there. Does it? Yeah. I agree. I... I think because when people work there as a nurse or a staff member or they volunteer there, you're there because you want to be and you understand how precious life is and there's no room for nonsense and it, it's really a genuine place where people really can be themselves and be loved for being themselves. So I have to say that Liz's and Lorna's ways and spirits are infectious and they have inspired many people along the way to do things and do them in ways that they never dreamed possible. I'm just proud to be a part of Bato. It's been a place of absolute love. Lane and I came here knowing that my dad would be taken care of but they've also taken care of us which we weren't expecting. I'm just hoping I slide away quickly. And yeah, I'll feel peace, for sure. Yeah. What do you think about death and dying? Well, I, I don't, there's no way I'm going to feel cheated because I've had a great life. So I, 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 there's, I have no complaints, but I'm in no hurry to die. Uh, I, I'll be more than mildly disappointed to die because I've got, I've got lots I want to do. Sometimes we throw our love away Give all we have and never get it back again This time I've learned the hard way It's best 
Just to walk away There's no reason left to stay There's no reason left to stay